Hey everybody, this is John Finn, Church Without Walls International, CWOWI.org or SupernaturalHouseChurch.org. You can sign up, go to our website, sign up for my weekly thoughts, which is a free, roughly two page teaching each Friday. At least it comes out Friday in the US, Saturday in Australia, and the other side of the dateline. Anyway, today, you know, always about the discipleship process, and today concluding part three of three parts, talking about once saved, always saved. Uh, today should be assurance for the believer. Because you cannot lose your salvation like you'd lose your sunglasses or your house keys. And, but I want to share today the conditions in which a person might lose their salvation. Uh, there's ample scripture with that. Uh, you know, in the past, I've, I've talked about how the Father God is the Father of our spirits. How we are born alive to God like Adam and Eve were, having not yet chosen. How we have to be born again, recreated by the Spirit of God in our spirit man how we retain our free will all the way to the end. I even shared last week stories of people who had died and as they were being pulled down to hell, remembered, you know, the Sunday school teacher or, or grandma or whatever, and they called out to Jesus and were, and were rescued uh, even at that last second, the, the last moments that the body has any sorts of consciousness or, or life on earth and the Lord is faithful to rescue them. So today talking about conditions where a person might lose their salvation. Is that in the New Testament? Well, consider, and the argument could be made of the parable of the ten virgins, where in Matthew 24, Jesus outlines the conditions of his uh, coming. And then in chapter 25, he starts out and says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like, he talks about ten bridesmaids who start out with their oil filled, but five do not refill their oil. And remember that the, the lamp is a type of the human spirit. The oil is the Holy Spirit. The light is the life given by the Holy Spirit. And five of those bridesmaids let the oil extinguish, let their light go out, and they were not admitted to the wedding feast with the Messiah, uh, with the groom when he came. <clears throat> so that's that, that argument can be made there. We also have Revelation chapter 3 uh, and verses 1 through 5 to the message at Sardis, where the Lord says, you were alive, but now you are dead. That's Revelation uh, chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, now you're dead. And then he continues through verse 5, and he says, to those who repent, who overcome, he says, uh, who, who will walk with me with white garments, and I will not blot their names out of the book of the living, but will acknowledge them and confess them before the Father and his angels. So the fact that in verse 5 he threatens, he says, to those who will overcome, who will wash their garments white, that is the robes of righteousness, I will not blot their names out of the book of the living, implies that he can blot names out. He wouldn't make that statement, that threat, unless it was possible that he would blot names out of the book of the, of the living. So it is possible there to, to show that, um, to, to, to show that, that there are people who can lose their salvation. What is involved in losing their salvation? Because frankly, with a believer whose heart is good, basically, but they get off into sin, what we find more often than not is the Lord will allow them to die early. And I'm not saying that every disease or accident or anything else like that is God's judgment. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I'm saying that there are cases like in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5 where the man had an illicit affair with his stepmother. And Paul said, I've turned such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit can be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And you'll find that often that a person's life will be cut short lest they commit a worse sin. I knew uh, when I arrived at the deathbed of an alcoholic that had been in and out of church, you know, going to church for a couple months and then getting drunk for a couple months. And he was 41, 42 years old when he died. <clears throat> and I arrived just at his, his bedside. His chest was just was just letting the air escape bubbles up his throat, you know, that, that horrible sound of death. And I asked the father, I said, do you want to raise him from the dead? And he said, no, I've brought him home, lest he commit a worse sin. Uh, you know, he, the Lord allowed the cirrhosis of the liver, the, the ramifications of his alcoholism to take part, to take place because he was on a roller coaster. He'd be in church, then he'd be drunk, and then he'd be in church, then he'd be drunk. And the, and the Lord brought an end to that and, and allowed him to suffer the consequences of his alcoholism and brought him home early, as the father said, lest he commit a worse sin. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are cases like that. First Corinthians 5, the, the guy that I just cited, I could think of numerous, numerous situations as I've been in the ministry and ministering to my peers from my teens on, you know, some 44, 45 years now. I've seen case after case where the Lord has brought a person home early. Um, you know, lest something w worse happen. They didn't lose their salvation, but uh, some people got off and various people get off and then, and then they are allowed to suffer the ramifications of their sin. 
But what happens to a person who's who just flat out rejects Jesus after having received Jesus? I know of a couple cases. Uh, one was a, a man who a man and his wife who um, were assistant assistant pastors, associate pastors in a church. Uh, they were going to have a baby. Uh, God supposedly prophesied that it was going to be a girl. Uh, they would not allow any boy gifts. They they had baby showers that was all pink and girls. And lo and behold, when the baby came, it was a boy. And it so devastated them and so embarrassed them and so humiliated them. They, they resigned from the church. Everybody didn't think anything of it. It's like, so they miss God. No problem. You know, they can, they can you know, kind of retreat and, and examine how they missed it. Uh, but uh, they, they went off. They ended up divorced. The man uh, went off into a school of, of Christianity that is kind of like, um, you know, everything is set. There's no free will. And, uh, and just fell away from the Lord completely and rejected the Lord. Uh, there's different situations where I've seen this. So what's the situation? Well, I, I shared with you out of Revelation 3, 5, 1 through 5, where Jesus said that to those who overcome, he said he will not blot their names out of the book of the living. What's the situation? What's the case where a person may have their name blotted out of the book of the living? Well, there are two scriptures in Hebrews. Now, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes when you bring up the book of Hebrews, people immediately want to disqualify it. Some will foolishly say something like, well, that's written to the Hebrews. And so it's not for us today. It's like, well, you know, do you, do you disqualify the Romans uh, and, and, and ignore everything, the book of Romans because it was written to the Romans? Or do you ignore Ephesians because it was written to the Ephesians? Uh, no, it's in the Bible for a reason. And the book of Hebrews is all about the superiority of Jesus over Moses and the Levitical priesthood and the Old Testament law. And so it's all about Jesus and all about uh, the things about walking with him and comparing him with the law and the Old Testament law. It's just as legitimate. The book of Hebrews is is just as legitimate for us today. It's a general epistle uh, written to, to for everybody. And there's a lot of wealth in there, as you know. It's a tremendous, tremendous open letter. But two scriptures in there in the comparison of the law of Moses versus the Lord. He says in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, <clears throat> he says, and he lays out the conditions. He says, how much more, uh, or he says, he says, it is impossible for a person who was once enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift uh, and partakers of the Holy Spirit and of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them to repentance because they're crucifying the Son of God afresh and putting him to an open shame. And so the writer lay, lays out these things, enlightened, meaning they have revelation that Jesus is the Lord, is the Lord. tasted the heavenly gift, they were born again, partakers of the Holy Spirit, they, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit and of the, the good word of God. The word of God there, the word word there, tasted the good word of God is rhema, not logos. Logos is the general counsel of God, Genesis through Revelation. Rhema is when God speaks to you. So this is a person who's enlightened, born again, filled with the spirit, used to God speaking to them, used to God talking to them, and then moving in the, the powers of the age to come, the gifts of the spirit. They're used to operating in the gifts of the spirit. If such a one who has all these conditions falls away, it's impossible to renew them to repentance because they're crucifying Jesus afresh. In other words, they know what they're doing. They, they, this is not new information to them. They're not baby Christians. They are mature Christians who know the Lord, walk in the things of the Spirit. If they fall away, it's impossible to renew them to repentance because, because they're, they're putting Jesus to an open shame again. In other words, they know exactly what they're doing. A similar scripture in Hebrews 10, 29, where he's comparing Moses and he talks about how, how, you know, if you disobeyed the law of Moses, you died under two or three witnesses uh, with two or three witnesses. So how much sore punishment, how much worse punishment do you think will, will uh, a person suffer if they do these three things? Number one, he says, have trodden underfoot the Son of God. Now, the trodden underfoot the Son of God is a colloquialism. It means to, to treat Jesus like trash. Trodden underfoot is something they did in those days and even into the 20th century where they, they, they tossed the garbage the non-biodegradable stuff out into the footpaths to be ground down, broken pottery and things of that nature, the dust from being swept up out of the house and everything. They just toss it outside into the footpaths. So this person is saying, how much worse punishment do you suppose a person is worthy if they treat Jesus under trodden underfoot, the son of God? That is, they treat Jesus like garbage. And number two, it says, or uh, they consider, uh, and they consider the, the blood of the covenant wherewith they had been sanctified as unholy. So this is a person who now treats Jesus like trash and counts the blood of the covenant, 
wherewith they had been sanctified as unholy. Something which is unholy is to be avoided at all costs. So this person is treating Jesus like trash now and, and, and counting the blood of the covenant as unholy, not wanting anything to do with the things of God. And then the third thing is, and has despised the spirit of grace. Despise the spirit of grace. That up to this point, the Lord is always seeking after, wanting to, to renew them, to bring them back to repentance, to bring them back to him. But this person despises, or in the Greek, it's more like mocking, uh, despising, hating the spirit of grace, which is trying to win them back. And he goes on to say, he says, in such a one as, as it says, vengeance is mine, God will judge his people. So in those elements there, we see it consistent with, you know, like I said, the argument for the 10 virgins or the five virgins from Matthew 25, if you want, uh, Revelation chapter three, uh, verses one through five. There's a consistency there that says, if you know what you're doing and you walk away from the Lord, you can't be won back because you, you know what you are doing. It's, it's a conscious decision. This is not talking about a Christian who has an emotional fit and says, this is too hard for me. I don't want Jesus, etc. That's just a baby talking. Now, the scripture lays out these are people who know exactly what they're doing. The decision to be born again, to respond to that enlightenment, to taste the heavenly gift, to move in the gifts of the spirit, to, to have God speaking to them, to, to flow in the gifts of the spirit. And if they turn away from that, which they know, it's impossible to bring them back. Uh, several cases, another case of a Bible school leader out of Kansas who fell away from the Lord, uh, had an affair, became an alcoholic, and... and um, and fell away from the Lord, had two separate men who were directly affected by that event. And they told me separately, separate weeks, separate time, not knowing the other had talked to one another, uh, that though they had prayed for the man, the Lord had interrupted him, uh, interrupted each of them and said, stop praying for him. He's made his decision. There are those cases, folks. You don't lose your salvation like you lose your sunglasses. If you, if you are concerned about your salvation, then don't, then you're safe. Because the people who walk away from the Lord, who permanently walk away, knowing what they're doing, they know exactly what they're doing. They don't have that concern because they know exactly what they're doing. So you can rest in this believer to know that, you know, like Jude talks about, Jude talks about people too, who, who says that they, they, they sometimes will pretend to be Christians. They will eat with you. They're, they're a hidden reef while they eat with the feasting with you. They, they're right next to you, but they, they're uh, a hidden reef. They're ready to make shipwreck. And, and Jude verse 12 says they are twice dead and that they are clouds without water. They have a spirit man, but they don't have the water of the spirit in there. That is possible for people to do that and continue on. And there's a lot of people that are in the name of the Lord who don't really know God, but they do things in the name of the Lord. You and I probably know ministers and such who there's no way that they know the Lord, but they, but they, but they say that they're Christian. Uh, you know, we're not talking about that. We're talking about people who are spirit-filled, know God, you know, love God, and then they walk away. They're, that's rare, but it happens. It does happen. So if you're a believer and you're walking with the Lord, don't worry about it. It's not for you, as I've seen in this, this whole series. Uh, you're, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You're walking with the Lord. You're going to continue on that. But the, the decision that got you saved to respond to the revelation uh, can also be reversed. And there are people who will walk away from the Lord. And it's, it's a sad situation, but it sometimes happens. Uh, but anyway, just to show you that, you know, Revelation 3, Hebrews 10, 29, Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, uh, the five uh, foolish virgins uh, from Matthew 25, uh, Jude, verse 12, etc., all talk about people who have known the Lord, had the light shining, and then let it extinguish. It doesn't happen by accident, people. They know what they're doing. All right, new subject next week. Hope this has been a blessing.